Hi, this is Ibby Owens, and you're listening to the award-winning podcast, Moms Don't Have Time to Read Books. I'm also the host of Moms Don't Have Time to Lose Weight, and I'm the editor of the anthology, which you should run out and buy, called Moms Don't Have Time to, a quarantine anthology. All proceeds of that book go to COVID-19 vaccine research. And I'm the editor-in-chief of Moms Don't Have Time to Write, a new publication on Medium, and we're accepting submissions, so please send your personal essays there. And if all that isn't enough, you can follow me on Instagram at Zibby Owens, and my website is zibbyowens.com. Okay, now back to this amazing podcast. Welcome, Alexander. Thank you so much for coming on Moms Don't Have Time to Read Books. It's my pleasure. I am really excited to talk to you about Fierce Poise. Look at this beautiful book about Helen Frankenthaler called Helen Frankenthaler and 1950s New York. Gorgeous. Um, congratulations on this. Oh, story. thank you. Thank you so much. And I have to tell you that my mother is like a massive Helen Frankenthaler fan and like, that right? like obsessed with everything about her. And so when I got your galley way back when I was like, oh my gosh, mom, you have to read this. Mm-hmm. So she loved it. And anyway, um, so I've been hearing about Helen Frankenthaler my whole life. Mm-hmm. So I'm delighted to talk to you uh, about the book today. So why have you fallen? Why have you decided to write a whole book about Helen Frankenthaler? Are you also a, a huge fan and have you been forever? Well, you know, Zibby, I think I've been hearing about Helen Frankenthaler my whole life too, in a, but in a slightly different way, which is to say um, Helen Frankenthaler went to Bennington College and her senior year was my dad's first year there as a professor. And she, Helen, took a class with him and uh, I guess they stayed in touch over the years periodically. I certainly recall her name uh, when I was growing up. Um, I was born in Bennington, um, though we moved soon after that, but suffice it to say that she'd long been in the back of my mind. Then I began to just be aware how much I loved her paintings. And sometimes when I write about artists, the, the reason for the liking, and there is no other reason to write about art unless you have strong feelings about it. So um, that's a given, but in, in sometimes the strong feelings, the reason for them is, is manifest right in a moment. Other times it takes longer. And I think, as I say in the book, I really needed to catch up to Helen and understand why her paintings moved me. And you know, Zibi, what I ended up coming away with was in choosing intuitively to write about the art she made in her 20s, you know, when she was just starting, because the book is about taking her from just after her graduation from Eddington to up to the age of 31, when she had her first one person exhibition, is that uh, I wanted to um, understand, value, love all the more Helen's way of portraying what it's like to be a young person and to We all know how intense being in our 20s is. And I think Helen was someone who lived that intensity in a very powerful way and moreover had the power to portray it on the wing, on the quick, life as lived, translated into aesthetic form. And I didn't necessarily, I was still, I had all those feelings, but I wasn't able to translate it into art and genuine feeling in quite the way that she was. So I think uh, better late than never. I'm glad I caught up to her in my 50s. And, <laughs> um, uh, you know, although Helen died in 2011, I feel like uh, we could probably have a decent conversation about her art where she alive now. Wow. And I love how you portray her has just, it's almost like she's just another girl in her twenties in New York. And like, Uh what she can, you know what I mean? It's like, and yet she becomes this legend. You have the scene, um, like when, when she was feeling depressed, you said, you know, starting around New Year's 1953, Helen became depressed. She was paying sick calls to her mother who was increasingly ill. Um, you talk about a bunch of other things here, blah, blah, blah. Um, 
New York Times critic gave faint praise to her heart and soul efforts, including her favorite, The Vast Mountains and Sea. The works were fresh, pale, and pleasant, sweet, and unambitious. Um, and then you said, sinking into lethargy, Helen found herself thinking that in her whole life, nothing mattered very much. Even her psychoanalytic sessions on which she usually placed great store struck her as boring. She was, quote, <laughs> not taking my life or myself or life or plans too seriously, not caring enough. She found herself taking afternoon naps. The sleep is wonderful, but the habit bothers me. And you just, quote, you said Helen was depressed because she felt like her life was at a standstill. So take me back to like that moment in, in her history and how that became a turning point. Yes, well, if there's one painting people might know of Helen's off the top of their head, it would be the painting you're talking about, Mountains and Sea, which she painted in one day, one afternoon, October 26, 1952. And although that painting now hangs in the National Gallery in Washington and has been there for a number of years, at the time, as the Times Review indicates, it was met with disdain, not just by art reviewers, but by Helen's fellow artists who thought it wasn't, I don't know, serious and angsty enough. And she was kind of lectured to by the artist Larry Rivers and also privately her friend uh, or sometimes frenemy Grace Hardigan was very critical of that painting too. But uh, Helen never really doubted that picture. You know, she said the lightest touch is always the hardest one. And that's something I've really learned from her. You know, we can think you, me, anyone that gravity, intensity, depth, as we say, is always the sole road, the royal road to seriousness, prof profundity. But Helen really brought me to appreciate, to value, the quality of lightness, uh, of air, of atmosphere, which that picture is so much about, and uh, you know, pleasure poised on a balance as ephemeral, um, you know, uh, uh, full of grace. All of these things is what she portrayed. She knew to spend any more time on it would be to ruin it. But her lethargy, Zibby, had to do with precisely what she says. She wasn't sure even if she should be an artist anymore, uh, even though she was really born to be an artist. Um, she even interviewed uh, kind of half-heartedly for a job at Time Life, though she was really put off by the starchy intellectualism of the whole Time Life building. Um, she also was invited to help campaign for Adlai Stevenson because that painting was made just a 10 days or so before the presidential election that Eisenhower won in a landslide over Stevenson. So she was thinking about different options. And then at the moment you describe, her show had gone up. She was still very proud of her paintings. No one was buying them. The reviews were diffident. Her fellow artists were suspicious. She was depressed for reasons beyond that. You know, part of what I say about being the 20s being an intense time as people, including Helen, are working out a lot of stuff and or not working it out uh, or both. And uh, the depression, I think, was something that happened to her as it happens to many people unbidden. Um, in that part of the book, I talk about her going to see this late Charlie Chaplin film called Limelight, in which there's a very beautiful ballerina who looks remarkably like Helen. She's pictured in the book and Helen, not surprisingly, identified with this ballerina who, you know what, had this kind of um, psychosomatic illness that convinced her she couldn't get out of bed. Um, that, uh, you know, just like Helen, you know, basically taking long naps and this feeling of illness and, inadequ and inadequacy was precisely related to her talent, you know, precisely related, if you watch the movie, which is wonderful, I think, uh, to her incredibly rare uh, ability as a dancer. So the same goes for Helen, which is to say, you know what, Zibi, when we talk about um, an artist, we use that word artist, I think 
uh, even me, whose job it is to talk about artists, can sometimes use that term very glibly, when in fact, it's a very mysterious term. And in Helen's case, it means there's a tremendous amount of energy, volatile emotion that is in there that is driven sometimes almost too fast for one's own liking uh, by a relentless pursuit of, uh, of aesthetic form, you know. Uh, I must make a picture. I cannot not make a picture. And that's, that's a volatile thing to handle and not everyone can handle it well. Helen uh, made it through, you know, without dumbing down or numbing down all of the different emotions from laughter to uh, despair that her work portrays. You know, it's so interesting because I feel like writers are a type of artist and I think so many writers feel the same way, right? They just have to write it down or they have to create and they have to, you know, dedicate their whole lives to sitting in in front of the computer on their sketch pad and trying to create at the expense of everything else, sort of similar to what you're saying about Helen. And like, there's so many people who are driven that way. And I'm wondering if you as a writer, because obviously, you know, there's so much research and you're like such a renowned sort of scholar of all of this material, but you were all, you know, as a writer, do you feel pulled to be doing this type of writing yourself? Yes, I do. I think uh, I'm much happier when I have written something in a day and uh, it balances sort of structures my life. And it is, so I imagine not just a matter of mental equilibrium, but also, um, you know, one is trying to make contact with life, right? To use words like Helen used paintings to portray what it is to be alive and, uh, you know, not in some universal sense, but precisely from the contingent, partial, limited vantage that one calls one's own. And yet the hope is that that, that, that perspective, that subjectivity, we call it, uh, is not merely subjective, but is precisely by being so specific, accessible to other people, right? So with Helen, I've never tried to write a kind of doorstop or um, omniscient biography. I've kind of used my own uh, feeling for her work as my pathway into it and hopefully not deviated from that at all. So uh, as you know, each, each chapter of the book is, is about one single day in her life from the year 1950 to the year 1960. It's kind of unabashedly partial in that way too, but it's also true to Helen's art in the sense that she, like me, would suggest that, you know, anytime you're writing a sentence or putting uh, paint on a canvas, you are presumably trying to, um, um, do something that is not the same as ordinary life, not walking down the street or mailing a letter or whatever the case may be. And it's, um, it's a religious conception of art in her case, which I'm attracted to, which is to say, you make a painting in order to reveal something about the world and that revelation is not didactic, it is not moralistic, it is instead kind of sensory and um, specific to feelings that are almost impossible to describe, but you know, feelings like lightness, um, lift, um, sorrow, you know, feelings that we have, of course, handy words for, but words that are just finally placeholders, you know? So Helen is someone who's pushing paint to be able to portray states of mind, states of being, even just the feeling of walking down the street with the light 
kind of dappling through the shadows of the trees uh, in a way that doesn't kill those experiences, but makes them live, makes them uh, visible to the rest of us. Beautiful. I mean, it's really like the power of art to evoke feeling, right? That's what, from your words to her work. That's really what all artists are trying, I think, at their core to do, right? Communicate what's inside their heads in some way to somebody else's head. It's really cool <laughs> when you think about it. I know that's ridiculous, but. Yeah, yeah. It's um, sort of a message in a bottle. Yes. You know, it goes out there and the, the artist can't be sure where it will land, but the person who picks up the bottle will be the person for whom the picture was intended. Um, and I love that you brought, that you mentioned the structure. I'm just holding up the book again. And I love how everything is in a day. That's so great. I mean, when you talk about like getting a slice of life of somebody's career, to do it in such a creative way is, is amazing. I mean, there's so many ways you could have approached her life, right? Like a yes. bazillion ways. I'm sure you debated <laughs> how to do it, but um, this is so great. And it just shows her growth as like an artist and over time. And I don't know, that's just a great tactic. I love it. Well, thank you, Zibi. You know what? I didn't debate it. You did it? You just knew right away? I knew right away that that's the way it would be. I didn't know which days. That was mm -hmm. kind of fun to let the research dictate what might, could, and finally were the days of the book. But I, I knew that it would be these days, yes. Oh. It would be this, structured on this days. This is my own, like, that I have to debate everything a million times. I'm just projecting how I imagined you would have done it. But <laughs> well, in fairness to you, I think sometimes that is the way it is for any writer, right? There are different formats and the the right format becomes apparent only in the writing of things. So I understand that. It's just in this case, somehow it wasn't, uh, I didn't need to go through that um, preparatory thinking. Yeah. I also love that this is an Upper East Side girl book as I sit here on the Upper East Side talking to you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, and I spent a whole summer at Bennington, by the way. So oh, I'm, did you? Yes, I'm very familiar with it. And I did a whole writing program, writing and photography. Wait, this is oh. way back when, but um, yeah. Wonderful, yeah. Yeah, so. yeah, yeah. I think um, Helen was such the Upper East Side person that when she did move to the Lower West Side, you know, she lived down in the West 20s when she was, when the book starts out, uh, I think her family, I think her mother, it was, was very um, shocked, you know, that yes. she would be living on the, on, the, on the west side, the lower west side, it seemed impossibly bohemian. Yes. Uh, right. I, I sublet an apartment in the meatpacking district when it was like just coming up a little bit south of that, but on the west side. And my mother on the Upper East Side had the same exact reaction. Oh, is that right? Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. anyway, um, so what what is coming next for you now? You have this beautiful book out in, in the world. Um, who are you, are you gonna profile a different artist next or what's your plan? Yeah, it's a great question. I'm contemplating what my next book will be. Um, I'm writing a very different book right now, which is about America in the age of Andrew Jackson, actually. Oh, I uh, just was doing that with my daughter. Her test is on Thursday. You're literally, I'm like deep in Andrew Jackson time. Wow. What, what grade is your daughter? Seventh grade. Oh, fantastic. Yeah, yeah. Uh, right, so it's about America in the 1830s and it's kind of, the opposite of the Frankenthaler book in the sense that it's told from the vantage of many, many people known and unknown from that time. So I mentioned Andrew Jackson because he's a good place marker for that era, the 1830s, but it's, um, it's actually a different kind of writerly challenge where it's uh, everyone from um, farmers, slaves, uh, poets, uh, painters, politicians, and so on. So I'm, I'm enjoying that a lot. Hmm. Wow, we'll have to read that one. Now I hmm. feel like I um, am so clear on exactly what was going on at that time, whereas 
perhaps had I not brushed up on it <laughs> over the weekend, I wouldn't have been. Well, uh, yeah, me too. Me uh, too. I mean, one writes, uh, I don't know if this is true for you, but uh, it, it must be in some way that one writes to learn, right? To, yeah. um, I think uh, writing about Helen, I don't know, there's this curious way that one writes from a position of feeling that one already has, as I was talking about, but at the same time, one discovers more the nature of that feeling by virtue of the writing. And I, I've been thinking about the Helen book now that in ways I didn't really appreciate when I was writing it, it was a kind of um, uh, coming into being of my own feelings about Helen uh, by virtue of writing the book, if that makes sense. Like yeah. not, not in a way that, that really I could turn into formulae and, you know, um, simple uh, descriptive sentences because I don't, I don't really believe in that. You know, I don't, I tell my students here, for example, that they should avoid the, the phrase, um, my book is about, uh, so, you know, this artist and so on, because that word about, though it's understandable why people use it, implies a you know, like the art is over there. And I, I say instead, you know, when, you know, you should say I write with the artist. And although the with is complicated because one doesn't want to be um, sort of just the public publicist as it were for the artist, right? That's not what it's about. Uh, the with I take to mean has to do with um, kindred feeling like wanting to inhabit the artist's fantasy and to write from that perspective, as opposed to distancing it and turning that fantasy, that whole imaginative life into kind of an object, which, you know, I don't know, is, lim is limiting, I think. Do you have any advice for aspiring authors? Yes, I guess so. Um, <laughs> write about, uh, what moves you, that's one thing, yeah. Um, and discover what it is that moves you by writing. And often I think that means instead of going to a museum and feeling honor bound to look at all 1000 paintings, each one for two seconds, instead pick one thing that moves you uh, maybe by an artist you know you want to look at, maybe, maybe by someone you've never heard of, whatever it is. It might be like a painting of a meadow with a stream running through it of a kind that even as you stand there for 5, 10, 15 minutes, a whole hour, or even for just 30 seconds before your friend drags you off to get an espresso, it stays in your mind and then it becomes the basis, the kernel for some idea and maybe it has to do with a memory you have maybe it has to do with some movie you saw once that featured a similar scene who knows but i would say right from that moment from that stream in that field and that stream is a kind of source uh, uh, for all that one has to give so i'm i guess a believer in the oak growing from the acorn Beautiful. Great. Well, thank you for coming on Moms Don't Have Time to Read Books. Alexander, thank you for this intimate look into Helen's life and her art, which I will never look at quite the same way again. And, um, and thank you for this conversation. You're very welcome. Thank you, Zibby. Okay. Take care. All right. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thanks for listening to this episode of Moms Don't Have Time to Read Books. Don't forget to follow me on Instagram at Zibby Owens and at Moms Don't Have Time to Read Books. Also sign up for my newsletter at ZibbyOwens.com and sign up for my virtual book club and meet lots of authors on Zoom every other week. Thanks so much to Steve and Ryan at Texture Sound for the sound editing. And thank you to Morning Moon Productions for providing this fantastic intro and outro music. 